Hi, I'm Bob Kesar, architect with the City of Louisville. America in the 1950s and 60s was looking towards the space age. We were in both a Cold War and a space race with the Soviet Union. The atomic age was seen as a scary threat and a potential power source for our planet. During this time, the design of residential and commercial buildings, as well as automobiles, took an optimistic look towards the future. In this episode of Renovate Louisville, we'll take a look at some of Louisville's mid-century modern homes and buildings. was coming home after World War II. Out of Pearl Harbor steamed the mightiest armada in history. It was a low hut and an inch slowly ahead. It was 1945. The war was over and the troops were coming home. The United States was a place of optimism. However, the atomic age had just begun. This was a period of rebuilding not only the infrastructure of the United States, but also the rebuilding of families broken apart by World War II. World War II seemed so far removed now. Factories no longer needing to produce machines for war could now focus on producing materials for a growing nation. New technologies and innovations for the war effort were in turn open to the public, offering not just a new style of living, but a new look to a higher quality of life. There's a fresh look to fun in America today. What would follow would be the greatest population explosion in the 20th century, giving way to the appropriately named baby boomer generation. Naturally, if there was a boost in the number of families living in America, they needed a roof over their heads. The basic freedom of the American people, which is the freedom of individual choice. There was a pent up demand for housing because First you had the Great Depression, where no one could afford the house that they lived in, followed immediately by World War II, where uh, all the boys were off at, at war, uh, and, and really family life was sort of put on hold. With the returning GIs uh, and their desire to start families, contractors and architects responded um, to, to the need. They selected a new, more modern technology uh, more modern house styles that reflected technology that World War II had fostered. What happens when an atomic bomb explodes? You will know when it comes. We hope it never comes, but we must get ready. The construction industry, like the automobile industry, utilized these materials in designs that looked towards the future and looked at the space age as the next frontier for mankind. Lightweight materials, large panels of glass, and other such innovations were all utilized in this new form of architecture known as mid-century modern. Architects and contractors uh, looked to futuristic designs. They looked to uh, innovative materials. It was a period uh, where the, the United States was feeling great optimism. Uh, a new architecture was developed to reflect this optimism and also to reflect the new technologies that uh, the, the war years had brought. Quite often, the use of those traditional materials was used in innovative ways that created a streamlined appearance. It was a cleaner line. Uh, it was devoid of ornamentation. This architectural style was distinct from anything anyone had ever seen before. Although mid-century modern architecture didn't become popular in the United States until after World War II, it actually derived from the Bauhaus movement and the European international style of architecture that began in the 1920s. This pure design philosophy behind the Bauhaus spread into the European international style movement and eventually was modified into the futuristic mid-century modern design style. So, why was there nearly a 30-year gap between the Bauhaus movement and the boom of the mid-century modern style of architecture in the early 1950s? Unfortunately, the rise of Adolf Hitler stunted the development of the Bauhaus and international design styles within Germany. Instead of building off of what the Bauhaus had accomplished, 
Hitler's militaristic regime favored the grandeur of more formal Greek and Roman styles of architecture. After the end of the war, the international style started catching on around the globe. What would be known as mid-century modern architecture would follow this movement. The characteristics of mid-century modern architecture are easily noticeable. If you've ever noticed large plates of glass accompanied by colored panels or masonry where the bricks don't overlap but are organized in columns, these are some of the common traits of the mid-century modern style of architecture. The international style came along and it was more of a theme of less is more uh, approach in which you emphasized cleaner lines, more uh, uh, straight appearance. The windows, instead of being punched windows, became banded windows of fenestration, so there was seamless bands of windows. Some may not appreciate the design style because on the outside it can seem, well, boring too uniformed and maybe unoriginal. And you can make that argument by looking at things from the outside, but you would be wrong. You would be committing the sin of judging a book by its cover. The, uh, the detailing of how the mullion works and the, uh, uh, the, the metal panels are fabricated are, are more like an art form. The designers went to a lot of effort to make the lines very clean and pure and not cluttered and so it has a very uh, simple and modern aesthetics. Again, getting back to that less is more uh, theme of, of the international style. The family at home is enjoying the convenience and the functional beauty of walls of glass, merging room with room, blending inside with outside. Following the war, families weren't satisfied by living in the confined urban areas. Instead of the traditional small, tight, compartmental spaces for houses, the mid-century modern movement went in the opposite direction. Public spaces within the home grew larger and were more open. New manufacturing technologies allowed for large panels of glass to be installed, supported by lightweight materials, which allowed natural light into the home. Walls of glass allowed nature to flow into the home, while the structure itself was designed to fit the natural landscape and the transition from indoors and outdoors became seamless. Well, one thing that is sort of a hallmark of, of modern design, and I, I believe it actually began with Frank Lloyd Wright, was you know, the idea of keeping things to a minimum. Uh, the private spaces would tend to be smaller, and the public spaces would be really more of the design focus. They would, they would be larger, and much more attention would be given to them. There was, there was the Victorian period where everything was just excessive, just everything excess everywhere. Lots of detail, lots of ornamentation, more, more, more. And, you know, this was clearly the opposite. And maybe it's a sort of zen aesthetic feeling that you can lead them possibly a less stressful life in a less cluttered environment. Working situations benefit from a new kind of layout, bright, open, and inviting. Residential homes weren't the only structures using this new design form. Businesses and industries also benefited from the clean and sleek modern design aesthetic. With this aesthetic, it was more factory-oriented, industrial, futuristic, and so you were able to fabricate the windows, uh, the panels, uh, off-site, in factories, shipped to the site, brought up via cranes, uh, and installed fairly rapidly. A perfect example of this new mindset can be seen in Louisville's Chase Bank Building. Businesses and industries wanted to be viewed as forward-thinking and innovative, and the mid-century modern design aesthetic helped to convey that idea. When it was originally built back in 1960, it was known as Liberty National Bank. It was designed by an American architect who was originally born in Peru. His name was Wenceslas Sarmiento. Mr. Sarmiento was uh, educated here in the United States, but he also studied while in South America with a very famous modern architect by the name of Oscar Niemeyer. People were going by at 35 miles per hour, 25, 35 miles per hour. They just really don't notice this building. It is also set back from the street by about 30 feet. So it's a hidden gem here in the middle of downtown Louisville that few recognize, but we're fortunate that uh, such an acclaimed architect has designed this structure here for us. Another example around town is the 800 building, which holds a reputation for polarizing people into either loving it or hating it. 
Regardless of which side you come down on, there isn't another high-rise like the 800 building around Louisville, making it unique among the other skyscrapers downtown. And it was uh, developed by a, a person by the name of Fritz Drybrawl. And uh, Fritz um, wanted to do a, a high-rise uh, uh, residential structure. And as we Louisvillians know, it has a distinctive blue panel exterior, which was William Aerosmith's signature color. The ununiform glazing appearance is one of the characteristics that some might not understand due to the inconsistency of the color palette that is displayed. However, what one should look to appreciate is the architectural form of the building and the minor details that feature a minimalistic design that can be seen in the balconies and in the hidden structure of the building itself. Again, it was that streamlined look that they were going for and stacked bond brick, very linear, gave it those clean forms and minimalist appearance that they, they wanted in their buildings. What do we want in a city? Everything we have ever wanted to fill our needs and meet our wishes. The mid-century modern style's influence can be seen in a variety of structures, from government buildings to commercial buildings, residential homes, and even places of religious worship Keeping to the tune of making buildings designed for the future, this ideology is never more apparent than in the United Church of Christ Sanctuary on Taylorsville Road. This uh, sanctuary and the offices were in the conference room were built in 1961. With this design, I, I don't know why they chose it. I've always thought that it was unique and um, theologically the fact that the front sweeps up you know, we think of, even though we believe God is everywhere and God is still speaking, you know, and God's active, that it sweeps up is, uh, is unique. The roof structure is defined as a hyperbolic paraboloid, uh, which was quite unusual and still very unusual for that kind of structure. The pastor at that time, uh, no one would have thought that he would have selected this type of architecture, and I don't know what possessed him to do that, but <laughs> uh, we're glad that he did because there's not another one in Louisville like it, and I'm not sure that there's too many in the United States like it. Uh, there was a lot of static about the type of project. Uh, one of the members uh, quite uh, outspokenly um, sent a letter to the committee uh, telling him his disappointment in it. In my opinion, Reverend Groves was straight-laced. But he, too, accepted the, uh, the idea and encouraged the congregation to proceed with the project. Looking at it from Taylorsville Road, the sanctuary looks almost like what someone in the mid-20th century would have imagined a spaceship of the future to look like. The parabola can be seen by looking at the very tip of the sanctuary, which slopes down so close to the ground. From the outside, it looks as if there's hardly any space inside for people to move around. Where you are sitting right now is actually underground. I mean, it's not a large portion, I guess, but the lower part, when you look outside, you can't imagine that you could actually stand in these corners and not hit your head on the ceiling because it's dug into the ground. And I think that's a great connection for us, is to have, to be able to see nature in a muted way, hopefully not distracting way, um, when, and, and to be part of it, to be so closely connected to it. The slope of the parabolic design is complemented by how the sanctuary is built into the ground. And this type of design element can be found in many structures built during the height of the mid-century modern movement. Mid-century modernism enjoyed a mainstream run for nearly 30 years. With the 1970s approaching and World War II further in the past, the United States Bicentennial was on the horizon in 1976. Thoughts moved from visions of the future to nostalgia of the past and the birth of our nation. Playing to that nostalgia was the colonial revival movement, and the mid-century modern style fell out of popularity in favor of a more historic context. With the nation's Bicentennial, architects and contractors were really nostalgic for uh, an earlier era. They were looking to the colonial revival. Uh, they were looking uh, perhaps to the, to the Queen Anne um, or earlier architectural styles as their architectural inspiration. And so with time, the, the fashion of mid-century modern uh, sort of faded away. Whatever the act, whatever its scope, the common element 
is designed. It would seem that mid-century modern had a flash-in-the-pan moment in history, but now it is all but forgotten. Except that it hasn't been forgotten, not by a long shot. History has a funny way of gathering meaning once enough time has passed. Pulp culture has created a sense of romanticism and fascination with this period in history. Nostalgia for the 1950s and post-war optimism can still be found right here in Louisville today. Well, a lot of times people will think of the 50s and they will think kitschy stuff, but there was a lot of really good design that was done during that period. Judy Champion Store 2023 caters exclusively to mid-century modern buffs. One glance around her store and it is clear why. Even though by today's standards there is nothing new about this style, there isn't anything as far as aesthetic design that comes close to the curvy oblong shapes of the furnishings from the 1950s and 60s. They say, oh, this is like a step back in time. And I guess it does have a little bit of that feel, uh, especially when you look at things like uh, gloves and, and hankies, people, things that people no longer use. I'd say the majority of my customers uh, are 20s and 30s. I had a young woman in the store yesterday who was about 13, 14, and she looked fabulous in these little cotton vintage dresses. So it's, it's a real range. So it, it's still popular. People walk in the shop and they'll say, Oh, this is really hot now. Well, it's been hot. I've been here 16 years. And it's, it's still, and it's ri riding an even higher crest, I think, right now, for whatever reason. For our home life, the stylists are creating new expressions of utility, convenience, and beauty in the everyday things that serve us. The mid-century modern movement was in full swing as the urban renewal was sweeping our country. Older buildings constructed around the turn of the century were becoming dilapidated and many were destroyed in favor of cleaner, more open structures. The irony here is that many mid-century modern buildings today now may fall under the same fate. Mid-century modern houses should be appreciated today uh, because they've already been built. The embodied energy that it took to construct that ranch house on that suburban lot, that energy has already been spent. Because they were so well designed to begin with, so livable, they are perfect for today's needs. The best thing about living here is just the space and the light, the clean aesthetic, just our world and what we enjoy. It's sort of like urban ar archaeology, you know, as you collect things, as you purchase things, you learn about things and you learn more and it sort of evolves from there. People may not appreciate this extremely original form of architecture. However, these buildings are now getting to a point where younger generations who did not grow up in this time may begin to appreciate the optimistic tribute to the jet and atomic age. Once one gets past the skin of these buildings and sees the soul and creativity beneath the masonry, steel, and glass, they should see something that can only be described as truly beautiful. Modern American architecture has a boldness Thanks to the men and women who design.